Welcome to Tokyo College online seminar uh, or lecture by Professor Yefda Ben Zayhan on clay earthquake preparation processes. My name is Mino Takashi. I'm Deputy Director of Tokyo College. Today, we have Professor Yefda Ben Zayhan with us. Professor Ben Zayhan is Professor of Earth Sciences at the University of Southern California and also serves as director of the Southern California Earthquake Center. He is now staying at Tokyo College as visiting professor and closely working with Earthquake Research Institute of the University of Tokyo. Today, uh, Professor Ben Zion will not only talk about the physical processes of the uh, large earthquakes, but also touch on how to improve our society's preparation for large earthquake. After the lecture, I will invite Professor Yokoyama Hiromi from Kabuli Institute for the Physics and Mathematics of the Universe of the University of Tokyo to give her comments and questions. Then, ho hopefully, we will have some time to uh, accept questions from the audience. So if you have uh, any questions to Professor Ben Zion, please uh, use the, uh, the question function of the Zoom webinar and send your questions to us. So uh, I hope Professor Ben Zion, you're ready to start your lecture, please. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, I want to express thanks to Tokyo College for inviting me for the visit, for ERI for hosting me, Takashi-san for the nice introduction, and I want to thank all of you for attending uh, this uh, seminar. Potentially damaging moderate and large earthquakes are quite frequent in Japan and California, as shown on this, uh, as shown on this map on the left, uh, that was uh, generated by uh, Kato-san, showing earthquakes with magnitude larger than 6.5 in Japan over the last 50 years. And on the right, uh, we show the potential for damaging, damaging earthquakes by colors on the main fault systems that indicate probability for earthquakes larger than magnitude 6.5 in the next 30 years. And red colors mean uh, high probability. So historically, uh, in fact, earthquakes uh, with magnitude magn of 6.5 and larger occur uh, every decade or so in, in, in uh, such active areas. So, so the occurrence of potentially damaging large earthquakes near large uh, populations is not a question of if, it is certain to uh, occur in the next few decades, one or more such earthquakes. So given this reality, uh, the question is what can we do in order to improve, uh, to reduce, reduce the seismic risk, mitigate the risk, and to improve the preparedness of, uh, and the resilience of society to large earthquakes. In this webinar, I will discuss several uh, initiatives, several types of activities that can help to reduce, reduce the seismic risk. The first activity is simply improved monitoring. This means just getting better, better data that reflects better the earthquake process. The second activity, is improved estimates of expected uh, seismic ground motion. Uh, the third one is improved society preparedness. The number four is improved earthquake forecasting. And if we have time, uh, I will also discuss several additional topics. Now, each of these categories of topics have many multiple subtopics, and I will not have time to describe everything. In each of these categories, I will describe only one topic that I think is most promising at present time. So when we talk uh, right away, I will move to improved monitoring. I will focus on near fault observatory. I will ignore the regional networks and early warning networks because they already exist and just jump to near fault observatory. 
when we discuss next, when I discuss next improved estimate of seismic ground motion, I will focus on simulations uh, within a physics-based uh, computational platform that is called CyberShake. Simulations of ground motions uh, that can be used to provide strong statistical, statistically robust results uh, on the ground motion we expect from large earthquakes. On improved preparedness, I will focus on community education. There are many other things that can be done, but I will just focus on community education. Improve earthquake forecasting. Again, this is a very big frontier of research. I will focus on localization of the formation before large earthquakes, using this phenomena to try to improve forecasting. And then again, if we have time, I will discuss several additional topics. Um, so I will demonstrate, the results will be demonstrated in the context of California, mostly, or Southern California, because I am more familiar with, uh, with the data, the networks, and results from California. But the topics that I discuss are general. They are applicable to Japan and essentially all other seismically active area. This figure, I'm beginning now with topic number one, improved monitoring. This figure shows the seismic, regional seismic networks in Southern California. And this is what I call far field view. This means we are looking at the faults and, 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 and the networks of station from far away. You know, the scale here, you see the scale at the bottom, there is about 100 kilometers. So this is very broad view, not focused view. And in this far field view, faults appears as very simple lines, straight lines, there are some names on the fault. For example, this line is the famous San Andreas fault right here. And the station density looks very high. But this type of far field view is somewhat uh, is incomplete. If we focus on any region, and I, I select a very simple part, section of the San Andreas fault right here. If you focus on this and zoom out, blow it up, we see immediately considerable complexity. So there are many fault traces, actually. It's not only one line. And geologists know that the complexity is even much larger than that. If we zoom in, this is still not very high resolution. If we zoom in, we see additional complexity. Also, what is important to emphasize is that we see now that there are almost no stations within the immediate vicinity of the fault. And again, I selected a section that is relatively simple and that already has some, some, some stations around them. Many other places are completely empty. So this situation, lack of near fault station is global. It is not limited to Southern California. Actually, Southern California has one of the best networks. Japan also has uh, one of the best networks in the world. But no place has dense uh, networks right in the immediate vicinity of the fault. So because of that, this is global problem. Uh, and in the past, the network were even less dense than what you see now. So at present time, even though society has been studying earthquakes for a long time and very intensely with modern method for more than 50 years, we still have almost near zero, essentially near zero constraints from the field, in situ constraints on earthquake rupture processes. Everything that we know is not from the near field, it's from the far field. It is from stations that are not in the immediate vicinity of the fault. And the problem is that information decays very fast with distance from the fault. So in these far field stations, we do not capture details of the earthquake process. So to try to improve on this situation, uh, SCEC, Southern California Earthquake Center, together with Airscope, a consortium is attempting now to develop a new initiative associated with near fault observatory. And you see a schematic, this does not exist yet. This is something we hope to do in the next year or two. We hope to begin this. But you see a schematic of the near fault observatory where we instrument very densely the main plate boundary fault. This is the San Andreas fault here in Southern California. And this dense instrumentation consists of arrays of sensors, all of these black lines. These arrays 
are separated every 20 to 30 kilometers along the fault. And each array has dense instrumentation with an upper chair of about two kilometers on each side of the fault. And it's gradual, it's more dense near the fault. Near the fault, we have well, fairly dense instrumentation. Uh, and, and the station consists of seismometers, accelerometers, GPS station, and cameras. Uh, this is basically the, 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 the core instrumentation. And we also plan to put distributed sensors, both across the fault and along the fault. And we, we plan to do this again, because at present time, despite all the seismological study, no one captured near field properties of moderate and large earthquakes in the field. People are studying this in the lab. In fact, this instrumentation is similar to what uh, the way laboratory specimens are instruments. But laboratory specimens are far simpler than the actual crust of the earth. And so we would like to capture detailed information in the immediate vicinity of the fault. Now, what, are, what do we hope to, to get here? So we will get a lot of information at all stages of the earthquake uh, cycle. Before rupture, we hope to see more detailed information on localization of the formation, which is a topic I will come back to in more detail later. Uh, so, so having this before earthquake, we will be able to see in more detail the final stage of localization processes. We will be able to see temporal changes of seismic velocity. We will be able to detect very small earthquakes and we may see additional signals that we don't know yet because they don't propagate to the far field. Uh, during rupture itself, when rupture goes on one of those faults that is heavily instrumented, we will, for the first time, be able to get the full evolving dynamic strength strain field, both shear and volumetric deformation. Uh, this has never been measured again in the field. We will be able to get from the immediate vicinity of the fault direct constraints on the width and velocity of rupture and slip velocity, inclu including space time variations. What people see from the far field is uh, just average processes. But with such uh, observatory, we will be able to capture the variations as well. We will be able to get to measure many other things, uh, seismic energy flux uh, that is not well observed in the far field. We will be able to measure peak ground acceleration, peak ground velocity, and peak ground displacement within and across the fault in these dense arrays. And also this array, while we are putting it not necessarily for early warning, it will, be, it will provide the earliest early warning because all of these instrumentation are right on the fault. And it also will provide information, uh, non-ambiguous information on which fault is rupturing and directivity, the direction that the earthquake rupture is propagating. Right after the earthquake, we will be able to observe in great detail the transition from the seismic, uh, uh, process to the aseismic, post-seismic deformation. Again, not only shear, but also including uh, small scale, short wavelengths, high frequency, but very important volumetric component. And then while we are waiting, this, this is an investment for decades. Uh, this kind of network should be in the field for, for tens of years. Uh, in the time that we are waiting for big earthquakes, we will be able to get very detailed information on the internal structure of the fault zone, which when integrated with the regional networks, a topic again, I will talk a, a little bit about later, will, be, will allow us to improve the location of earthquakes. Standard, uh, all, all standard derivation of earthquake properties, locations, focal mechanisms, sleep, everything will become more focused and more accurate when we add detailed information uh, of the fault zone structure. And finally, without a question, there will be some surprise discoveries and applications because we really don't know what we will observe. We never made such observations. Every time a big network is being deployed, there are always surprise discoveries. A good example is from Japan. So after the deployment of the high net and kick net networks in Japan, following the Kobe earthquakes, uh, non-volcanic tremor has been observed in Japan first, 
because of these very little networks. And then subsequently, it has been observed in many other places in the world. So we, we certainly anticipate, uh, this is kind of like a black box. Nobody look inside here. And if we have this detailed observatory, we will have some surprise discoveries. The next topic I want to discuss is how do we go about to improve the estimates of expected strong ground motion from earthquakes? So the problem again, the most hazarded earthquakes are large, large earthquakes are rare. So there is no place in the world where many large earthquakes have been observed instrumentally. Earthquake engineers, in order to accumulate information, they combine data from all over the world and they just put it in one type, one data set. But the problem with this approach is that it averages processes from many different locations and it does not account for particular effects that would be associated with a particular basin structures. For example, the Tokyo basin structure or the Los Angeles basin structure. You cannot see this if you average data from all over the world. So the only way uh, to, to actually uh, improve the estimates of expected strong ground motion is through simulations. And the Southern California Earthquake Center developed an integrative physics-based platform for uh, estimating hazard uh, strong ground motion that we call cyber shape. And, and this is very powerful. This is already working now. And, and I think it can be used in other locations such as Japan. So I want to describe to you briefly how cyber shape, what, what, how the cyber shape works. So cyber shape combines forecasts from computer simulation, forecast of hundreds of thousands of earthquakes in California uh, with information on source models for each of those earthquakes. And then from this uh, combination, uh, we calculate wave propagation, seismic wave propagation from these ensembles uh, of hundreds of thousands of earthquakes using 3D uh, model of seismic velocities at the subsurface, the best model we have. And from this, we get millions, many millions, tens of millions of seismograms everywhere in the volume from which we extract billions of features, uh, seismic features that are being used to calculate hazard curves and hazard maps. Um, so this is very powerful and it's already being used uh, to, uh, it's under consideration for improving building codes in California, in Los Angeles and also in, in California. Now the results up to date, uh, this has been, this has been, this started about 10 years ago. The current result extend up to one Hertz, the simulations of ground motion. This is, this is all done on supercomputer. This is very heavy uh, simulations from hundreds of thousands of earthquakes. Uh, so so the, the calculation go up to one Hertz and one Hertz is very important for tall buildings, but most structures are not tall. They are actually short. And to, to perform similar type of cyber check simulation for the, the bulk of the distributed infrastructure, we really need to extend this to higher frequencies. 10 Hertz would be a very good target. Now, extending the simulation to 10 Hertz require, first of all, improving the computational scheme. But in addition to the computational scheme, it also requires a better velocity model. So I come back to the, what I mentioned before, the rupture observatory. The current velocity models that we use simply don't have detailed information to, that is reliable up to such high frequencies. So the next, briefly, I want to describe to you an effort to calculate multi-scale velocity models that would allow simulating, making cyber check simulation up to one Hertz that will be far more useful for earthquake engineers. So, so this topic is illustrated in this current slide. Uh, this, this plot here shows the original velocity model with features at a length scale of five to 10 kilometers that are being resolved only. So we don't resolve smaller features and it, it will not be useful to make calculations up to 10 Hertz in, in such a velocity model. On the other hand, 
There are many other local, much more detailed velocity models that has been derived by many groups in California and the same situation I'm sure exists in Japan. For example, here is a model, a velocity model near major faults with resolution of one to two kilometers uh, based on some better data. Then we have in particular locations, uh, we have in fact extremely detailed velocity model with a length scale of 20, 20 meters here and 10 meters here. Much, much more detailed than the five to 10 kilometers here. Of course, these type of velocity models exist very locally, only in particular locations. Also, we have even more detailed information. We have borehole information in boreholes with resolution of sub meter. And in Japan, there are many boreholes uh, with, uh, with very good local seismic data. And the, the issue is that all of this information is not really being used. There is no place, no way to integrate this information within the regional velocity model. So we are currently working on a methodology to embed all of this multi-scale detail within locations where such information is available <clears throat> and then extrapolate with the use of machine learning, uh, extrapolate this information to other places where we don't have boreholes and, and such very detailed velocity models uh, based on dense arrays. And so I think th this is a very important topic that will utilize all available velocity models and will allow, uh, to go back to the previous slide, will allow making cyber check simulations up to 10 hertz that are very useful, uh, will provide very useful information for building codes that will improve resilience of structures. The next topic I want to discuss briefly is public education and uh, preparedness. Southern California Earthquake Center has a, uh, a group that is dedicated to such efforts. And over the last uh, 20 years, uh, 25 years, they've been very active and they created many products that are useful for public education. Um, I am sure that such activity exists also in Japan although I am not familiar with it. Uh, so I will just give some examples from the work of uh, the Southern California Earthquake Center on public education and performance. So there are a few highlights that I will touch on. One is SCEC. SCEC is an acronym for Southern California Earthquake Center. SCEC created in California what is called Earthquake Country Alliance that consists of about over 400 people that are leaders in government, business, and local communities. So it's a network of people that are working together to have consistent messaging, consistent language. Uh, this uh, group, Earthquake Country Alliance, produce have, uh, workshops and webinars uh, on mitigation. And they also produce, have some literature that has been produced, written material, very simple written material that can be understood also by children. Uh, one example is this, uh, it's quite well known in California, seven step, steps to earthquake safety. Simple things you can do before, during and after earthquakes. And, and this literature has been translated to many languages. In fact, the top 15 languages that are spoken in California, which includes the Japanese. Uh, so this is available and there is a website here when you can see additional information uh, that is produced by this organization. The other uh, high visibility product of, uh, of SCEC on community preparedness is the great shakeout drill and less famous, some, some uh, exercises for tsunami. So the great shakeout started in 2008 with about uh, six, seven million people and very quickly it became a global uh, phenomena. And just before the pandemic in 2019, uh, the shakeout drill uh, had almost 68 million people globally, uh, including 6.8 million people in Japan participated in this drill. Um, there's also, as I said, there are also some exercises on tsunami, which involves uh, walking away, evacuating uh, low regions. 
And for improved preparedness uh, for the future, uh, what is really important is to create regional uh, partnerships of public, private, and community leaders that develop together consensus messaging and uh, they implement coordinated uh, outreach strategies and the shared resources. And the other very important thing is to have develop some activity of neighbors, really local community, because local communities, the neighbors are usually the ones that can provide the most, the most rapid uh, emergency services. So it's important to create these uh, local networks uh, of communities and prepare them for some uh, immediate uh, uh, activities following large earthquakes. I'm now switching to a different topic where I will provide a little bit more details. Uh, and this topic is now improved earthquake forecasting. How can we improve earthquake forecasting? Earthquake forecasting is the perhaps the most uh, important and also the most difficult goal of earthquake science. There have been uh, many, many efforts. Uh, and, and so far, none of them led, has led to actionable activity. Now, with improved instrumentations uh, and with improved uh, results from laboratory experiments and also computer simulations, uh, I, I think there are promising prospects how we can try to move forward on the earthquake forecasting problem. And I will emphasize an approach that is based on tracking localization of rock damage and seismicity before large earthquakes. This is what I will try to explain in the next 10 minutes or so. Um, so when we look in laboratory experiments, we take a piece of rock and we deform it in the laboratory. What we see is for a long time, the activity, micro seismic activity in this rock volume is concentrated in the entire volume. It's distributed. So this occurs for a long time. The, 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 the figure at the bottom illustrates cycles. So this volumetric activity occurs during most of the cycles. In terms of percent, it's probably 98% of the large earthquake cycle duration, the activity is distributed most of the time, maybe 99% of it. So it occurs for a long time, but then at some point, the activity begins to localize. And at the end, this localization process accelerates. And at the end, there is a localized rupture, which breaks the, this particular uh, surface uh, in a large event. This is a system size event. The, the figure on the left is in fact an uh, image of cracks inside the rock volume. And you see that although the, rup the rupture is not very simple, this, the, uh, the, the blue colors show the localization uh, zone during large earthquakes in the laboratory experiments. And here you have some background events that occurred before. So in the crust of the earth, earthquake ruptures occurred many times along big faults. So, the faults already to some extent are localized. However, the, after a large earthquake, there is a very long interseismic period where material properties uh, are recovered. There is a healing of this rupture surface, partial healing. And what you see here in example, this is an example from the Southern San Andreas, Andreas Fault in California that certainly had many large, very large earthquakes over the last few million years. But, the, but this figure from a few years ago shows that the seismicity, the seismic activity currently is distributed over a zone that is tens of kilometers wide. And we see the same situation, broadly distributed seismicity along all major faults in normal times, not in the time immediately before large earthquakes, but in normal times. Seismicity is very distributed. Also, when we look at geodetic data, geodetic deformation, it's also shear strain is distributed over tens of kilometers around big faults. However, after, during and after a large earthquake, the activity, instead of tens of kilometers, will be concentrated in maybe 10 meters. Big rupture occupy 
10, maybe 100 meters, maybe even less. This is why we need the rupture observatories that I mentioned at the beginning uh, to actually measure what, how exactly, uh, what is the width's uh, dynamic during the rupture. So, so, so but, but without a question, it will be very narrow, much, much narrower than these tens of kilometers. So the question is, just like in the laboratory, uh, this localization process is being monitored, can we monitor localization of the crustal deformation in the crust of the Earth with seismic, geodetic, and other data possibly? If we can, this monitoring will provide information on approaching time and potentially also the location, the spatial extent and the size of future large earthquakes from the size of the localizing region. Uh, and then also another issue that is very important is when we monitor, when we try to monitor the crust in contrast to laboratory experiments. In laboratory experiments, it's very clear what to monitor. We monitor the volume of the specimen, but in the crust, it's hard to know ahead of time which region to focus on. Should we measure, should we collect data and analyze data from the whole of California, the whole of the world simultaneously, or should we focus on sub-regions that are more active? There is no obvious way to select regions. The localization process, if we find it, if we find localization, uh, that also can be used to select zones of space and time for additional analysis. So there is multiple benefits from this. And I will demonstrate uh, some results from recent works in California, <clears throat> together with Ilya Zaliapin, a colleague of mine. And what we try to do, uh, what you see in this map, a location of four earthquakes with magnitude larger than uh, seven. These are the red stars. So uh, this event in 92, Lander's magnitude 7.3 is the first in the sequence. Uh, this one was, this one here is the second. Uh, this one, Hector mine is the third. And finally, a few years ago, three years ago, there was a magnitude 7.1 earthquake here called the Richcrest earthquake. And the blue dots are very small, small, not very small, magnitude two to four, small background events that occur all the time. So this is a, this data, uh, data that is about 30 years of data. Uh, and what we try to do, what I will show you is we are trying to use all the small events, all the dots here, the small events to try to uh, find signals of localization of the formation before the big events shown here in the stars, okay? And I will show two types of analysis. One, and this is a bit technical, uh, uh, but I hope you will be able to, to follow most of it. I will show evolving, the evolving fractional area that has activity. So, so, so this is a cumulative plot. It shows activity over 30 years, but the activity occurs at different times in different places. So we are going to try to track where does it occur. And then the other signal is we will try to track how earthquakes combine to produce growing clusters. And, and we will see that there is some useful information in this type of analysis. So the way we do this uh, is explained now here briefly, and then I will show results. So here is again Southern California, and, and this is a map snapshot at a given time interval. The colors indicate number of events in cells on the surface of the Earth. So, so red, of course, means high number of events. And you see that at this particular time interval, uh, most of the area is white, is empty. So again, activity does not occur everywhere and it's moving around. Now we want to quantify how concentrated, how localized is this activity at different time intervals. And with the way we quantify it is illustrated on the right. We are using what is called receiver operating characteristic to plot the seismic activity in the following way. On the horizontal axis, we show the number of cells on the surface of a map that are being used. And on the vertical axis, we show the proportion of activity that is included in this fraction of cells that is being 
counted, okay? And the most active cells are, 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 are put in their, their order. So the most active cells are on the left and then less active cells are on the right. Now, if the activity was completely uniform, as shown in this example, this is an example of the same number of events, but distributed uniformly in all cells that have at least one earthquake. So some cells that are empty remain empty here, but the rest are just distributed evenly. So if this is the case, this is a hypothetical case, but in this hypothetical case, this receiver operating diagram will follow the diagonal line. In other words, we will accumulate all the activity progressively in a linear fashion along the diagonal line as we add more and more cells. But in reality, what we actually see for this particular time interval is the blue, this blue curve on the receiver operating diagram right here. So, and this is because the seismicity is not uniformly distributed. It is more localized as you can see here. If you compare this picture with this picture. So the way we quantify the degree of localization is we calculate twice the area between the actual curve on the receiver operating characteristic diagram and the diagonal. And twice this area, this is called the Gini coefficient. That's the name that is attached to this, twice this area. In this particular case, the Gini coefficient is 0 0.8. This means relatively high localization. If it was completely uniform, the Gini coefficient would be zero because the blue line would collapse right on the diagonal, okay? So this is the method. And now what we do, we take data at a given time interval and we make two types of comparisons. First, we compare it to data at the previous time interval. And, and this comparison gives us a measure of what we call relative localization. In other words, we check how in time, as time moves forward, does the activity become more or less localized relative to previous time? So this is relative localization. We also compare this data at any given time interval with uniform distribution. And this is called absolute localization. We just see how is the activity localized, the degree of localization we suspect to background uniform distribution. So let's look at some results now. So I'm going to show you on, on the top, the relative localization of, of seismicity in Southern California over 30 years um, at the top. And at the bottom, there will be the absolute localization. Actually, both figures will show the same. We will see cycles of distributed, uh, distributed deformation, then localization, et cetera. So positive value, which will be in red, will indicate that the activity becomes more localized. Negative value, which will be in green, will indicate that the activity becomes more distributed. So here's a phase. There was a big earthquake somewhere here. I'll show you, in fact, let me show you now. So now I put the times of the four events that we had earthquakes larger than magnitude seven on the diagram. And you see that at some time before those events, both the absolute and the relative localization are high, they are red. After, after such big event, the activity becomes more distributed. So we go from the red to the green, it distributed again around the big uh, faults, it occupies very large volume, and then after some time, it starts getting localized again. So, so this type of uh, activity uh, indicates this signal, not activity, the activity are the actual seismic data, but this analysis, this signal shows maximum localization two to four years before the magnitude seven events. If we had data in the immediate vicinity of the fault, probably we could extend this to be closer to the time, not immediately, but it would be closer to the time of the big events. Now, what is important to emphasize here that we don't select any particular earthquake sequences. Uh, so this is, this is very important. We analyze uniformly all the data with no selection. Uh, and, 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 and this signal includes many small sequences of earthquakes, including many foreshocks, but we don't care. We don't separate foreshocks from, we simply analyze the entire seismicity. 
and and the now if we select if we and this is very important because we don't know ahead of time where events will occur but in this particular case we analyze data of events that already occur so if we select regions around the hypocenter epicenter of these events uh, if we select and repeat the analysis with this selection we actually get more precise signals so which is shown in this diagram so here you see this is another way of of plotting the Gini coefficient and you see now that we get localization one to two years before the biggest events in the uh, all also events before them one to two years we get a high localization that is statistically significant the next signal that I want to show you is associated with uh, coalescence of events into growing clusters so this is again a little bit technical I will just explain in words without showing you equations we developed together with Ilya Zaliapin we developed a technique to measure the proximity of earthquakes to each other in a combined domain of, mag of magnitude space and time so we have a measure of proximity uh, we don't call it distance because it's not geometrical distance it combines space time and magnitude we have a measure of proximity of each earthquake to all other earthquakes this is all available in publication so I'm skipping details here but we can calculate this proximity measure and we can compare it with what would we expect from random distribution of earthquakes in space random distribution in time and magnitude that are taken from power law distribution which is the distribution that earthquakes satisfy uh, on, in a large region okay so we can compare the actual proximity with expectation from generic random process consistent with earthquake properties and if the proximity is smaller than what we expect from the random background events we consider the events to belong to clusters to a cluster okay so so by applying this proximity measure and, and comparing with random distribution and designing a threshold that separate the random background events uh, from clustered events we create earthquake clusters like this we form earthquake clusters and we demonstrated in the last 10 years that this works very well in California and also globally by analyzing uh, catalogs large catalogs of earthquakes here I'm only focusing on what happens in the localizing zones so remember in the previous plots I showed you that there is some localization process that occur two to four years once we before larger earthquakes once we find this this zone we can analyze the evolution of earthquake clusters within the zone and what you see what we see here is that earthquakes uh, have growing clusters with very high the largest cluster size are always achieved about one year before the magnitude seven earthquakes so this figure summarizes the results on localization using a diagram from a paper that was published last year with uh, Aitaro Kato in Nature Reviews so what we observe based on this this is a small number of earthquakes only four earthquakes have been analyzed in fact we since then I don't show you the results but we also analyzed another four or five large earthquakes in Alaska and we see similar phenomena so what what we find is that several years before large earthquakes we begin to get localization of rock damage and localization of shear deformation in a fairly large area that surrounds the rupture of the future large earthquakes this localization process is larger than the rupture zone but it surrounds it uh, so so this occurs several years before the the uh, large earthquakes then we also find later in time individual small events tend to coalesce to clusters uh, one to two years before the large events 
And now I want to emphasize again that this whole localization and coalescence process includes four shocks of many sequences. We don't separate sequences. We analyze entire seismicity. And eventually, there are many four shocks, many sequences. One of them eventually triggers a big event, but it's not important. This, this particular trigger is a statistical, it's not possible to identify ahead of time before the large earthquakes. So it's better to focus on processes like this that you can identify and process before the large earthquakes. Now, this is just based on seismicity. Geodetic data can provide additional useful information, but the data currently are fairly sparse, not very detailed. Hopefully with additional satellites that are being launched in the next year or two, and we will have uh, and improve techniques of denoising the satellite images, we will have more detailed geodetic information and we will be able to see this localization process also in the geodetic data. And as I mentioned before, this localization process is not only important for its own sake, but it also can be used to define space time windows that can be used to analyze other signals that many people are analyzing. Uh, and, and this gives a more focused target of space time windows for such signals and together all of this can be used to develop multi-signal signal hierarchical forecasting strategy. Now this topic, the, the data, the, 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 the earthquake process is very complex inherently and the data are also very complex. So it's also very important and I want to emphasize this, it's important to test all forecasting rigorously by an independent facility uh, for example, the Southern California Earthquake Center developed such a facility. It's called the Collaboratory uh, Study for Earthquake Prediction. This is an independent facility. Anyone that proposes a methodology of the type that I suggest here, submits this methodology to the facility and that facility tests this objectively along with many other uh, proposed forecasting methodology. So, so this is now as expanded, it started in California, but there are branches all over the world, including here uh, in Tokyo, there is one uh, branch of this testing facility at the ERI in Tokyo. So I'm coming to the last uh, topics. Uh, how much time do I, do I have? Uh, well, um, if you, I think it's valuable. Uh, please continue and finish. Your, okay, I will try uh, to. I will try to be brief now. I think we have. Uh, I I will very briefly describe a few more topics here that I think can be very useful, and I'll try to be quick about it. First, we have now much better algorithms based on artificial intelligence that are operating quite well and detecting better earthquake catalogs and better focal mechanisms catalogs. So I think it's very important to continue to use them and ideally using better data from the monitoring topic that I mentioned at the beginning. This is one topic. Second topic I want to mention very briefly, uh, almost all large earthquakes uh, in the last few decades were always surprising in the sense that they occurred in places where we did not actually expect to have a large earthquake because the fault map did not have large structure. The earthquake I mentioned in Southern California are exactly in this category. They fit this example. So here are the earthquakes I discussed before, Ridgecrest earthquake, Hollander's earthquakes. There are big structures here that were, became clear when the earthquakes occur. But before the occurrence of the Landers earthquake or the Ridgecrest earthquakes, no one knew that there is a very large structure that can host earthquake larger than magnitude seven. Why people didn't know? Because with time, the fault structure uh, evidence is being uh, erased gradually, covered by sediments and become more and more difficult to, to, to observe. And so what actually exists in geological maps are just segments of the fault, but we don't see necessarily if they are or are not continuous. Also earthquake seismicity do not occur in interseismic period all along faults. Here's a good example from the San Andreas. That's the main fault in California. And you see this long section has almost no earthquakes. 
So the general point is that ERSC faults, large structures are manifested only partially by different data sets, partially by fault maps, partially by seismicity, maybe partially by velocity models, partially maybe by geodetic data of uh, shear deformation. So the topic I'm discussing here, and there is no methodology for this yet. This is something to do in the future, but I think it's very important to develop artificial intelligence, machine learning techniques to search simultaneously in all available data, topography, seismicity, fault maps, et cetera, for large partially hidden structure that have only partial manifestation in each of these different data sets. Uh, so this is my second topic. The third one, um, it's important to develop uh, improved methodology to have rapid simulation after large earthquake, such as Ridgecrest, to be able to forecast aftershock probabilities uh, in a reliable way. This is done today already, but the results are not very good. We need to improve the methodology uh, to, to forecast aftershocks and also to aid emergency and science responses. And finally, this would be my last topic uh, that I want to mention briefly. If you look at the fault map like this or anywhere in Japan or anywhere in the world for that matter, we see that faults typically are geometrically very complicated. There are many junctions. Faults are intersecting each other. So all of this complicated geometry is not stable. It evolves all the time. Every time there is a, a big earthquake, the structure itself evolves. For example, we have this structure now after the Ridgecrest earthquake. Now, when the structure evolves, for example, uh, the, also the elastic, uh, the seismic velocities are reduced. Uh, there are many things that, that change after a big earthquake. So when the structure evolves, the properties that control future earthquakes also evolve. So it's very important to develop improved physics-based simulators that account for coupled evolution of earthquakes and faults. If we develop such method, such theoretical models and simulators, uh, I believe that they will have considerably more accurate information, more predictive and more accurate information on future activity. So, uh, this is basically, uh, again, the slide I showed you at the beginning, and I thank you for listening, and I'm happy to address questions. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Professor Ben Zion, um, uh, for your very interesting uh, lecture, and actually, uh, it was very uh, informative, I would say. And uh, uh, we have learned from your lecture that um, the, the monitoring techniques and uh, future estimate are improving, but still kind of resolutions of the prediction is not enough. And that's why, uh, as you have mentioned in a lot of part, the uh, um, a lot of research uh, going on. And uh, uh, we expect this would contribute to our future uh, a lot. Uh, now, uh, I would like to invite um, Professor Yokoyama Hiromi from um, uh, Kabuli Institute of Physics and Mathematics of the Universe. Uh, she is uh, uh, deputy director of this institute, and uh, uh, she specializes in modern science theory in the humanities and the sociology. This means she's looking at the uh, the science, knowledge, and science uh, from human and the society side. So from that perspective, I would expect some questions that's comment from uh, Yokoyama sensei. Would you please? Thank you so much for your introduction. Uh, Professor Ben Zion, thank you so much for your great presentation. It's very impressive. Uh, it is a great pleasure to be able to ask some questions as a commentator. Uh, my background, PhD, the background is physics, and I also uh, studied uh, simulations. So I can imagine there are many uncertainties in the simulations, and the, so and I was impacted by the cyber shake um, simulations. So could you tell me the what kind of uncertainties is the very important in the cyber shakes model? So there, I can imagine there are many, many parameters, and the, if we, we can if we can increase the monitoring, the resolution will be improved. But the, uh, what is the important uncertainty in the, the cyber shake model? 
Yeah, thank you. And thank you for this good question. So the CyberShock simulation, as I showed, consists of combining simulation of earthquake rates. They already have some uncertainties, but for each result, ensemble of results, we use hundreds of thousands of earthquake we combine. So this is not so crucial. There are some uncertainties. Then there are uncertainties in the source process in each of these earthquakes. But the biggest uncertainty is really in the velocity structure, mm -hmm. the velocity model that is being used to calculate the wave propagations. These velocity models, as I pointed out, are accurate on a length scale of five to 10 kilometers. And even that, uh, even in, on that scale, they do not have good they are not accurate in the top few kilometers of the crust. Mm -hmm. So the biggest uncertainty, to answer your question, the uncertainty is at every step, but the biggest uncertainty is in the, in my opinion, is in the velocity model that is being mm -hmm. used. Mm -hmm. So we can improve. The nice thing about the cyber check simulation is that the methodology is known. In contrast to forecasting earthquakes, for which we don't have methodology. It's something we need to work on. But for the cyber sex simulation, the methodologies are available actually. Uh, so it's just a matter of focusing resources, developing better velocity models, and then running simulations uh, again. And of course, the, we are validating, I didn't emphasize this. So it's very important to validate the simulation against actual observed data. So we use some particular examples of large earthquakes that were recorded to validate these simulation results. Mm -hmm. So I believe we can improve. This is a very important topic. Uh, I am uh, highly interested in this, specifically in developing these multi-scale velocity models and with the multi-scale velocity models and validations, having this loop iteration, I think we will get better and better uh, uh, estimates of strong ground motion that will be generated by big earthquakes in any given region. So this is specific to a region. For every region, you need a velocity model, and then you want this. Mm, thank you so much. OK, the second question is about AI-based uh, simulation. So uh, if you can use AI, so deep learning, uh, it will be a black box. And the physical science, we can uh, e uh, explain about physics-based uh, theory. But if, we, if you can use AI, so some part of the analysis cannot uh, look well. So how do you control uh, AI-based analysis? in this area mm. so the way we control this is we compare we always compare we always benchmark it or val verify it against other methods mm. so for example you mentioned simulation we use ai both to analyze data but also for simulations some people are trying to develop more rapid simulation techniques using ai now how do we know that it works well we compare the results Mm -hmm. uh, against the method that I showed. The method that I showed is classical method. It's finite difference calculations of wave propagation in a solid. So actual solving the wave equation in a solid. This is the traditional approach. And it's very time consuming. Now, if somebody proposes an AI-based method, we can simply try, run, mm -hmm. and we compare the results. And we can actually see, and we also compare not just between methods, we also compare both results to data, actual data. I so we must, we must compare, we must validate, we must verify and validate. This That's is right. The, yeah. only, the only way to. Thank you so much. So, in our institute, many astronomers are using AI and they analyze the uh, galaxy data. And the, so, the, it's the one of the big topics in science itself. Thank you so much. And the last question. So, I'm very interested in localization analysis also. It's very impact uh, for me and not only me but all the world uh, so but it looks like uh, some kind of prediction so earthquake earthquake prediction uh, is very very discussed in society also so how do you feel the pre earthquake prediction and also the localization analysis hmm. yes i 
I think the localization analysis, I am optimistic, I'm hopeful that the localization analysis can be used to develop what I call hierarchical multi-signal approach for earthquake prediction. We start, it is connected to the processes before large earthquakes. So we start by analyzing the entire data without selection, and we are searching for localizing zones, mm -hmm. as I showed. If we find localizing zones, we do additional analysis within these localizing zones. For example, I showed, I showed a coalescence of earthquakes to growing clusters, but we can do many other things. Uh, many seismologists look at properties, things like rates of earthquakes and size of earthquakes and all kinds of parameters that come from statistical laws of earthquakes. And the problem is when, when you just do this without selection, usually they select space-time regions. Often they select it after a big event occurs. They go back and select the region around it. But this mm -hmm. is not practical. We need a strategy that would allow us to also find, select the regions. So yes, mm -hmm. the localization uh, process, if we can detect it, uh, if it's, we can show this for more large earthquakes using also geodetic data, I think it provides the basis for developing operational multi-signal prediction algorithm that uh, can help forecasting large earthquakes. Mm. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your uh, explanation. So it's, it's great. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Yokoyama. So uh, we uh, still uh, have some time and we are getting uh, questions from the audience. So I would like to uh, pick up some of them. Uh, the, the first one, uh, Yes. Um, uh, so, uh, hi, uh, Yehuda. Uh, from your experience in geography and training, have you identified certain typical problems that impede nature and the people's uh, development? If there are any, what are they and how should science and technology development overcome them? Wait, wait, wait. Problems that impede nature and people development. Mm. Well, I would say, I, I, I'm not sure I understand the question fully, mm. but I can just give a very general, it will not be satisfactory answer, but, but what impedes nature and even humans development is just complexity. And nature is very complex. There are many variables, uh, many processes that occur simultaneously, and also people. People are subjected simultaneously to many kinds of pressures. Life is complex. So maybe you meant something else. I'm not sure what, what you mean, but but we need the we need the when we study a scientific problem, we need a careful strategy to try to extract information. Uh, in a gradual, in a, we, we, we need a strategy to be able to focus on prominent processes one at a time, separate them and understand what is happening and then combining together. Uh, so I'm not sure if this is, this probably not, does not answer your question, but yeah, if you want to type and, and explain a, a refinement of the question, I can try again, but. Uh, but this is the only answer I can give now. Hmm. Okay. Uh, maybe, uh, well, if you some feedback comes, then uh, you can further discuss the issue. Uh, I just find a very interesting question uh, th that is in Japanese, <laughs> written in Japanese. Okay. So I try to uh, translate. Um, so so the, uh, the way of thinking that you have uh, given in your lecture uh, is that um, the uh, uh, that, that that is applicable to any regions, any either Japan or California, wherever? Uh, so uh, that's a common kind of common strategy to apply. 
However, um, say there must be some differences between the regions yes. and what is the significance or the meaning uh, to uh, do the research on individual regions? Yeah, so, so yes, there are differences between the, the different regions. Uh, in California, for example, California is dominated by a transform plate boundary, shear dominated plate boundary that there is a horizontal movement. In Japan, in contrast, uh, Japan is dominated by subduction zones. Mm -hmm. So while the, there are some general, the, the strategy that I describe is general, it would be useful in all places, but I do expect regional differences because the actual faults and the, the type of loading on the faults it changes from location to location. So it's very important also to study to study these phenomena locally in different regions. There will be differences. We can borrow methodology but you have to study it in your own region because it will not be the same, exactly the same. It will be similar, but not the same. Mm -hmm. So the type of the, 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 the earthquake may be different because of the, uh, the mechanism. The types of faults mm -hmm. are different. Mm -hmm. The rock type is different. The loadings, the direction of the loadings is different. And all of this, uh, Will, will produce some variations from one place to another. Okay. So in order to predict or in order to, to see what's going to happen, then you have to do some uh, specific research on, on individual regions. Yes, and this is specifically applicable. A good example is, again, I go back to the cyber shake. Uh -huh. The cyber shake, we can do this in Southern California. And we can, we use information on the velocity structure in Southern California and we can calculate expected ground shaking in Southern California from the faults in Southern California and the subsurface structure in Southern California. Now, if you wanted to do it in Tokyo, you will have to use information relevant to Tokyo. You would have to use velocity model subsurface structure for Tokyo, faults around the Tokyo. They are not, the methodology will be similar. The logic will be the same, but you will have to use local information in order to get estimated ground motion in Tokyo. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we still have time and uh, we are still expecting some additional uh, comments or questions from the audience. So if you have any questions, please use the uh, this Q&A function. And uh, uh, well, th there is another question. Uh, I'm not sure if I understand this correctly. Um, well, so the, it's happening and uh, uh, it didn't, uh, or, or uh, well, it didn't happen. What, what do you think about the next couple of weeks? Uh, I'm not sure mm -hmm. what does that mean? So, so uh, um, maybe. <laughs> Yeah, also, I'm, I'm not, I, I'm also not sure I understand the question. Uh, <clears throat> I would say, I don't I, I will give a general answer. Uh, what we do, we need, we must always compare what we predict, what we estimate with what is actually happening. I'm using a word from this question. Mm. It's happening, not happening. Well, we must compare. We must make forecast of ground motion or earthquakes and compare with what is actually happening. We need to calculate the, uh, the differences. We need to incorporate this as uncertainties into our future forecasting. So what is happening or not happening in reality is of utmost importance. Mm -hmm. We must measure and then compare. Yes, thank you. Uh, I, actually, I... Uh, myself uh, have uh, some questions and uh, uh, I'm not specialist in earthquake but I, I lived in Japan that is an earthquake country so uh, in that sense I'm exposed to uh, quite many different types of discussion about earthquake and my point is uh, to say you have uh, uh, introduced many scientific bases 
uh, of the uh, uh, earth research. And uh, uh, of course, these are very important part and this may help a lot uh, with respect to the, uh, our uh, preparation for the earthquake. But at the same time, probably you may have been exposed to different type of discussions, including the communication with uh, people or social scientists uh, or humanities people. And uh, if uh, you can uh, introduce some of those uh, different types of experience, means the interaction with a social scientist or uh, from uh, your view, you can give a contribution to uh, the earthquake from scientific view and how these are uh, accepted or discussed among humanities or uh, uh, social scientist people. If you have any questions on uh, the, the experience. On yeah, yes. Yeah, so, so, so at SCAC, Southern California Earthquake Center, we have a particular group that are uh, in charge, we, they, they, they go under the name communication, education, and outreach. Mm. And what they do, they take the science results and they translate the science results to public outreach. And it's very important and it requires special skills. This is why we have a particular group focusing, working just on that. I actually, in my talk, I mentioned some uh, some activities of this group, including the great shakeout drill. Mm -hmm. This is an activity that they engage millions of people, tens of millions of people all over the world. They also produce uh, education material. Uh, and some of this is for children with, with uh, nice uh, you know, cartoons, <laughs> some for grown-ups. Now, the other part that we didn't talk about yet, but is also very important, is how do we interact with decision makers? How do we interact with the political structure? Again, we need, uh, this is very complicated. We need, society has all of these components, has um, political leadership, decision makers, industry, and then you have the public. Uh, and so, so there's no, we, I mean, we, we have to have uh, groups that uh, have expertise, in communicating with the public on one hand, also communicating with decision makers mm -hmm. on the other. I myself personally have some interaction, limited interaction on both sides. Mm -hmm. I sometimes give public lectures. <laughs> it's a form of interaction with the public. I, I sometimes speak, talk with uh, some uh, leaders uh, that are decision makers, but I'm not an expert on on neither of this, and I recognize the importance of these activities, and I think uh, we should do more. I think that I should try to find more time for mm -hmm. more interaction on both sides with mm -hmm. the public and with decision makers. Probably uh, some new interaction with different people may uh, give you a little uh, different insight into the issue, so uh, that could help. Uh, uh, in certain cases. Um, I agree, yes. If uh, I can ask another question, uh, maybe no more question from the audience. Uh, my next question is the, the difference between California or, or the US and Japan in terms of the, the for example, actual uh, measures, uh, like uh, say, uh, for example, legislation, or uh, some standard against the earthquake uh, or um, education uh, method or material, whatever uh, aspect, uh, if you see some difference between Japan and the US or California and Japan. So can you repeat? I didn't understand. Difference in what? In... Uh, yeah, I will say, for example, in legislation, the, the focus may be the, the oh, in legis uh, legislation. legislation or a standard for building or whatever uh, engineering type of uh, uh, standard or some, something, some related rule or more soft part, well, whatever. <laughs> the, the, this is a very good question. Mm. And I, unfortunately, I don't have the knowledge mm -hmm. uh, to make really a comparison. Mm -hmm. I think it would be very important 
I'm sure some people can make a comparison mm -hmm. on legislation, differences in legislation, differences in building codes, differences in, in some other uh, measure, even uh, education of, of public, but, but I don't have this knowledge, so I cannot provide an answer. It would be very interesting. I am not, I'm sure that in some aspect, Japan is leading. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm guessing <laughs> in some aspect of engineering, in some aspect, in some places, Japan is leading in other aspects, California, the US is leading. And it would be very useful to make a comparison and try to benefit, but I, I, I don't know, actually. Okay, but uh, in, in fact, the basis is the science, and in that sense, there are a lot, uh, lot of uh, uh, collaboration and the common uh, work uh, yes. to do together. The science, uh, science is common. The earthquake problem is global, mm. and although, as we discussed before, there are regional differences in how you would apply this, but the problems themselves are common. It's the same physics. Rocks is breaking, waves are propagating, uh, essentially, the physics is the same. So, so scientists are collaborating. There is certainly collaboration between US and Japanese seismologists. We should increase the collaboration. But this is common. The other things are not necessarily common anymore. And it would be useful to understand the differences. OK. Uh, actually, we still have some time. Uh, Yokoyama-sensei, would you like to ask any additional questions? Or... Well, Thank you so much. So no? it, it was very yes. interesting discussion. So I am also interested in how can we communicate to the decision makers, uh, policy makers, and also scientists and with publics. So, um, but, uh, Yes, uh, science is worldwide and uh, we can access many people, but the, the, sometimes uh, it's difficult to uh, communicate uh, with um, publics. So because the uh, risk, risk acceptance uh, will be changed sometimes or, or uh, some group when the, uh, in Japan, uh, uh, we remember uh, Kobe, big earthquake, not only uh, Kobe, but also, of course, the Fukushima uh, disasters also. And the uh, some area uh, people uh, uh, prepare the, the earthquakes, but the, the, the other area, uh, people don't uh, care about the earthquake sometimes. So, but the, uh, we don't we don't know uh, we, which, which area is the most uh, uh, risk uh, high potential? So we have to uh, care about the, the earthquake, not only in a local, local point, but also in the uh, all fields. So, well, so how can we improve the, the, the sense of the earthquake or how do you how do you think, Professor uh, Benzayo? Not only California area, but also the other area uh, in United States. So, uh, in United States, people interested in earthquake or not? Um, are there any differences between the area? Mm. Yeah. So this is a this is a very good and very difficult question. So I think people yes, people are interested in general. I think also decision maker, politicians are also interested in general, but the earthquake problem is not very high priority. It's not high priority. Why is it not high priority? Because, and it's very unfortunate, it's not high priority because the most recent large earthquake already occurred in Japan. For example, 2011, the Tohoku earthquake or Kobe. So society has short memory. In the last two years, we, we have so there are so many problems in societies that society has: pandemic, wars, economy, uh, and, and you know many other many other problems. So 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 people care, but they don't remember. It's not it's not it's not up on the priority list. Both public and politicians. How do we bring this problem up? 
to the awareness, uh, it's, it's a very, I don't have a, a simple answer. So discussions, as I said at the beginning of my seminar, the probability of large, future large earthquake in California and Japan in the next 30 years is almost one. But we cannot say if it will be tomorrow or 20 years from now. And the last earthquake was already 10 years ago. After Kobe earthquake, there was a very big uh, improvement in seismic instrumentation in Japan that was very useful. Uh, so there was a big impetus. Also, uh, after Tohoku, there was big activities. But then it decays. Other problems take go and, and have higher priority. So it's a very complex situation, and I don't have a, a simple answer. When I go back to California next year, um, I will try to have discussions with uh, a group of people that are not necessarily earthquake scientists from other sectors, mm. maybe maybe economy, maybe maybe a few other fields. And 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 we will try. I will try to. Recently, I wrote I wrote a, a very short paper, opinion piece, trying to explain what I said now. That it's very, it's a very good investment of money actually, to 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 follow some of the steps that I mentioned. It will be expensive, but not nearly as expensive as some other experiments that, for example, are done in physics. In physics, there are facilities in astronomy, facilities that, that have price tags of billions of dollars. Now, they are very important. I don't want to take money away from them, but the impact on society from these activities is, is very, very small. The impact on society from better preparedness for earthquakes will be very large. And so this is a, almost an obvious investment it makes sense, it's a good strategy, but given all the other problems that politicians face with elections and wars and disease and so on and so forth, it's very difficult to bring it. But I think we must try. We, we should just try to reach uh, leadership in local level, in the, in the city, in the state of California, federal government, and, and, and keep on explaining that it would be a very useful investment that will save many lives and money, actually. Mm -hmm. Because the damage from one large earthquake is in the hundreds of billions of dollars, mm -hmm. one. And in the next 30 years, we will have more than one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it would be useful to invest it now, uh, a fraction of this, we will save uh, many lives, and also it will be useful economical investment. That's right. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. So I also think the continue to discussing is very important. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, there is one more question coming in, and uh, probably this is the last question um, I can pick up. Uh, the question is, I totally agree that the near fault observatory is important to uh, deploy before a large earthquake, but it is not easy to specify the location. The location, the localization is useful, but still lacks of the uh, detailed spatial information to uh, deploy the near fault observ observatory. Uh, do you have any idea about this point? Yes, so this is a very good question. And for this reason, we need, first of all, the observatory that I showed, the schematic diagram, uh, covers several large faults. It covers the main, all main large plate boundary faults in California, not just one. And it was not focused on one geographical area, it was spread along the fault. Also, as I emphasized, this kind of observatory should be deployed uh, with a view to decades, just like the network, regional networks in Japan and California are deployed and are maintained over decades. So we're not putting it for a short time interval. We need to put it in the field while we are waiting. We don't know, this is completely correct. We cannot, we don't know when the next network will go. So we have to spread it in along, along the entire plate boundary and 
while we are waiting for the big earthquake, we called, collect a lot of information from small earthquakes that we can use to improve the velocity model to detect, to, to provide much better catalogs, et cetera. And, and then integrating this with the regional models will be very, very useful. So I, I agree with that comment. I'm only again summarizing my answer. We, we should not focus on a small area because we don't know where it will occur. We need to spread it. And we need to think uh, about time intervals of decades that this will be in the field while, we, while it's sitting there, we collect a lot of data that allows us to get the very detailed velocity models of the type I showed, a few. Uh, and, and, and then uh, sooner or later, if we wait, I mean, we have to put it for decades. We will have multiple moderate and large earthquakes in the area, and we will capture more than one. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor and Zion. I think it's time to close uh, the session. And uh, I, again, would like to express my sincere thanks for your very, very informative and uh, exciting uh, lecture. And also uh, thank you, uh, Yokoyama Sensei, Professor Yokoyama for uh, stimulating discussions. And uh, um, of course, the, I would like to uh, express my thanks also to uh, uh, audience who participated in this uh, lecture. So uh, thank you very much. And uh, uh, I will close this session. Thank you very much. Thank you.